Congratulations to everyone on their uh, iron ring. Um, hope, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to wear it and get used to it. Um, two more weeks left in this term, so we've got a few more interesting problems to look at in integer programming particularly. Um, my main focus over the next few classes is to expose you to a variety of interesting ways that integer problems can get used. And we will also look at how the solvers uh, solve those underneath. So it's not just, um, not just an abstract concept of hitting F9 in GAMS and it goes and does something. Um, so we'll get to that, but still in today's class, we're still looking at a variety of ways to set up problems. And let's just recap the one from last class. This is the set of notes prior to this. Um, so the one from last week, if, if you have those notes, uh, you can take them out here. And we were looking at this idea that when we ship something, there might be an initial cost of $25 just to ship and then an incremental cost of $5. And we established uh, last class that if you wanted to create this function, um, if you did it just with a single variable XP, you create something which you can't actually use in GAMS because of the discontinuity. This function is of the form um, 25 plus 5 XP and that first part holds if XP is positive and otherwise it's zero if XP is zero. So if you're not shipping any product, you're not paying any shipping fees, but the moment you ship a certain amount of product that's non-zero, you're paying a base case 25 plus five dollars incremental. Now this is shipping, but chemical engineering processes work like this. Labor, uh, labor is incremental. When you're operating a pump, there's a base price just to operate the pump plus an incremental fee depending on your pumping speed. Uh, distillation columns work like this. There's a base case just to turn the distillation column on plus an incremental cost for the reboiler duty. Right? So we always have this term is often called uh, just your overheads or your fixed cost. So this idea of a fixed cost plus an increment doesn't just, this is not just one example of it, it, it occurs everywhere. So we should understand how to model this discontinuity. In GAMS, you cannot go put this in because of that discontinuity. But we can introduce an integer variable. We showed last class. We can now reformulate this as XP and then add a binary variable delta. And where we left the class was to say, how do we represent that? And there was this idea that you could write it as 25 plus 5 XP and then post multiply it by delta. In other words, you're, you're switching that entire function on or off. Or you could write it as 25 delta plus 5 times xp. OK, so let's just see what, what your search variables are here. In this case, you've got, you're trying to determine whether you, how much kilograms of product you're going to, to ship. That's a search variable. Delta is also now a search variable. So which of these two representations might you feel have one advantage over the other, or really should it not matter? Remember, this was the, the question at the end of last class. So delta, in case you're wondering again what this no notation is, delta, we said, is either 0 or it wa it's 1. It's a binary variable. So which, which of these two representations would be preferable? There's two ways of representing this. Both really say the same thing. Delta turns the function on or off, the entire function on or off, or the second version turns just the base case, the fixed price part on or off, and then leaves the 5xp separate. The first one, so first one is, is preferable. OK. Other suggestions? Does it, does it matter? Firstly, let's establish that. Does either approach matter? Joseph? OK, so delta, remember, is an integer variable that goes to 0 when xp is 0. 
We, we introduced that last class. Let's, let's bring that back again. So a lot of confused faces here. There's been a lot going on this weekend. So let's see here. Delta was a binary variable, either 0 or 1. We introduced the fact that xp minus delta is less than or equal to 0 is a way to switch on or off delta. Let's take a look at that. So either xp is 0 or xp is some number above 0. Let's take a see how is this constraint feasible. This constraint is feasible if xp is 0 and delta is 0, then that constraint is satisfied. Okay, now if you're trying to ship a small amount of product, let's put it at 0 0.5 kilograms. You're shipping 0 0.5 kilograms. What value must delta take for this constraint to be feasible? Okay, delta must be 1 for that constraint to still be feasible. So delta is either 0 when you're shipping nothing, or it's 1 when you're shipping something. Okay, so that was, that was how we get that. Let's go back to our question then. Which of these two representations is a preferable way of doing that? Yeah, we're going to we're going to take it away from that in a minute. Yeah, okay. So, of these two representations, this this question actually I think Mark asked it last class was why why post multiply the delta by the whole function or just bring the delta in and multiply it by just this fixed portion and turn that on or off? Both give you the same representation. The preferable one, of course, is the second one. The first one is not preferable because you form a nonlinear term over here. You're multiplying xp by delta and forming a, you're creating an NLP where really none actually needs to exist. So by bringing delta in and just pre-multiplying that 25 and leaving 5xp here separately, you're still keeping the advantages of an LP but getting exactly the same logic happening, this if-else logic happening. Okay, so so that's where we left last class. If that's confusing, you have to rewatch the video from last time. Okay, let's uh, let's move on then and address Joseph's question. Let's take it a step further here and add a constraint so that package weights currently here are constrained to one kilogram. What if we wanted that to be thirty kilograms? Well, we showed then last class what we do is in that situation. It's it's just a continuation of the text that's on the top of this page. We will then add a constraint that says xp minus capital M delta is less than or equal to 0, where m is your upper bound. In this case, m is 30, so we'll put that in over there. Okay, so just recap that again if that's unclear from last time. It's this part that we covered right at the top of the page over here where we were looking at the amount of flour and adding that indicator variable in. So it's the same sort of logic there. xf minus m times delta, m being an upper bound on your amount. OK, so that's one type of, of use of integer variables that we've seen. Um, we've seen this sort of if-else idea. Now let's take a look at another way that integer variables are used very, very commonly and to great advantage. It's called the knapsack problem. Now, this is not a practical problem that you'd want to solve necessarily as an engineer, but I'm going to show you how you can extend this knapsack problem to being useful in an engineering context. But this type of problem is, is a generic problem in, in optimization called the knapsack problem. The idea is that you've got this knapsack that has a constraint. You can at most put 15 kilograms in that knapsack. You've got these five objects to select from. The first one is 12 kilograms. The next one's one kilogram, four kilograms, one kilograms, two kilograms. So obviously you can't pack all five of those objects into the knapsack. You've got to pick from some smaller grouping of them to pack into the knapsack. That's your constraint. Your objective here is you want to maximize the value in the knapsack. Okay, so you want the maximum dollar figure in the knapsack without violating the, the mass constraint. So take a look at that example there. Which of those five objects would you select to, 
meet that requirement. Maybe discuss it with the person next to you. It takes 15 seconds to figure out the answer in this case. Maximize the value in the knapsack subject to the weight constraints. You've got five objects. You can pick one. You've only got one object. Once it's in, it's in. Yeah. Okay, so which objects are you going to pick? All of them except for the green one. Suggestions? No? TR? Um, three four kilo weights and three one kilo and two dollar weights. Okay, so you've taken duplicates of the same object. Okay. You can't. There's okay, so let's let's rephrase that. Maximize the value in the knapsack subject to the weight constraint by selecting from a finite number of items. Okay, so once it's in the knapsack, it's in. You, it's not available to put in a second time. Okay. So which, which of those five objects do you select? Everything but green? Everything but green, everything but green. Okay, so it seems to be fairly intuitive. Take all, f all of them except that green one. So objects two, three, four, and five might be the optimal solution, just from inspection. Okay. Now, in engineering situations, we see these types of problems. For example, if I say to you, you have a budget of a million dollars, and you've got these five projects. Each of these projects has a certain NPV, that's the dollar figure. This project here has a $2 NPV, $1 NPV. So the figure here on the left is the profit. The figure on the right is the cost of doing that project. So you want to maximize the use of your $1 million budget, that's your constraint, by picking one project, two projects, three projects, four or five projects at minimum cost. Okay. So in engineering, we, we see this. You did the, an example of this in 4N, but you did it intuitively. In the same way you solved that knapsack problem in a few seconds ago, you can do that. But when it comes to larger projects in a larger corporation, that's not solvable by just inspection. Okay, so I'm going to take it a step further in a minute, but let's just take a look at the GAMS code here for that particular knapsack problem. If you wanted to solve that GAMS code for that case, um, here you go. You set up your objective function down here. And if you look, if you scan down here, your objective function looks a little bit messy. It's the sum of vj times xj. Well, what, is, what does that mean? Let's Maybe go step back. Vj is the value of the object, and Wj is the weight of the object. Oh, sorry, I'm misreading. Vj times xj. So xj, I apologize, is whether you include that object in the knapsack or not, multiplied by Vj, the value of the object. So there's my objective function: is the value of each object multiplied by whether it's included or not. If we just write that out a minute. It's going to expand in GAMS to 4 times x1 plus 2 times x2 plus 10 times x3 plus 1x4 plus 2 times x5. So this is maximizing the value. Each of these, x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, is integer. The constraint here, there's a single constraint. The weight constraint is given to us here is multiplying the weight j by xj. So the weight multiplied by whether that object is included or not. So 12x1 plus 1x1 times x2 plus 
4 plus, is that the last one, 2. OK, so that's your weight constraint, is what it expands out to. So we want to understand that the knapsack problem is actually a really simple problem. It's a single objective function and a single constraint. And your x values are all integer. There's no continuous variables here. Every x variable that you're searching against is either a 0 or a 1. Either you pack it in the knapsack or you don't. Either you take the project or you don't take the project. OK, so every, every one of these problems can be reformulated in this, in this particular way. The reason for me putting the GAMS code here into the notes for you is that you can start to see and use the set notation. It shouldn't be unfamiliar to you, but we've got these parameters here. We've got these parameters here for the weights. Don't manually code in these coefficients, the 4s, 2s, 10s, 1s, 2s. You, would, you could, of course, write your GAMS code like this and solve it, and it would be quite valid. But I want to encourage you to move to this generic table type form, because if you change these coefficients, it's a quick way to update your code and rerun it. Those of you that are doing projects, a um, few of you are doing projects where you're selecting from a whole group of objects. Uh, for example, one group is going to the grocery store and finding the prices of products. Right? So instead of hard coding the prices down here into these equations, they should be putting their prices in a table. That way, then, if they go to no frills or Fortinos, and they get a different set of prices, they can rerun their problem by just changing this table, and then nothing needs to change down here. Okay, so it keeps your problem generic. Yes, Susan. Uh, where do you, where do you tell GAMS that it's either on or off? Okay, good question. Where do you tell GAMS that it's either an on or off variable? It's right up here. By specifying it's a binary variable, it knows that it can either be a 0 or 1. Normally, in the past, you've left that word binary out. You've just written variables. And then GAMS knows it's a continuous variable. So that, just that one extra word there forces it to be a binary variable. Yes, Mark? You could say integer variable? No. Instead. Binary is a very specific word here for GAMS. Yeah, but like, you could have continuous integer or binary? Um, I forget what the integer word. I think it is integer, but I can double check on that. Yeah. I typically have just used binary in the past. OK, so let's step up this complexity, though. This is a very straightforward problem. I'm going to take it to this situation now and ask you, ignore these last two columns. But we're going to now take this knapsack idea and extend it to a project. You've got a budget, and you want to allocate that budget efficiently. So maximize the profit. This is the value that you'll get from project 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. Each one of these projects is zeros or ones. And there's a cost involved. Okay, so I'd like you to write out a similar objective function. Leave some space. You've got some room here to write out the objective function and your constraint. We're going to add some extra constraints here to step up the complexity of this problem. But write out initially just your objective function and your constraint for this knapsack type of problem. Ignore the last two columns for now. Objective function and the constraint.
Okay, so what's the objective function? Any suggestions? Yeah. Profit, value minus the cost of doing the project. Okay. So I'm noticing from what a few of you have written, yeah, you've subtracted the income minus the cost and trying to maximize that, presuming I, that this column is income. Okay, what I probably should have restated that is that NPV, that's the NPV value or the value of the project, that it's already got the cost included in there. Okay, so my mistake, uh, just seeing that from what a few of you have written, you've subtracted it out, but my intention there is that V, the, the value here, is the profit already as a net present value. Remember, net present value is income minus expenses, takes depreciation into account, and take some um, time value of money into account. So what's our budget? Yeah, we're going to get to that, yeah. So if you've done 50 minus 8 times x1, 72 minus 21 times x2, I understand what you've done. It's just my mistake for not emphasizing that that column there is NPV. So if that is NPV, let's, let's write it then as 50 times x1. That says if you choose to do project x1, you're going to make or get a value of 50. If you choose to do project X2, you're going to get an additional 72, then 25 for the third project, 41 for the fourth project, and for the fifth project, you'll get 17. Okay, let's assume that you have a budget of capital B dollars. So the cost then is that you want to use at most capital B dollars to do these projects. And your constraints then land up in the obvious way, A times X1 if you're going to do the first project, 21 times X2 plus 15 X3 plus 10 X4 and then the last project will cost you 7. Okay, so x1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are simply binary switching variables, switching projects on or off, and then those constraints mean, this, oh sorry, this single constraint means that you won't overspend your budget, but you'll make the maximum NPV. Let's add this complexity now. We saw a bit of this in 4N. As this, pr as this problem stands right now, each one of these projects is independent. So it's written here, all projects are independent, which means you can do one, two, three, four, and five with no relationship to any of the other. But let's, um, let's add just this very first dependency that project one cannot be done with project two. So one, not with project two. In the same way two is here, cannot be done with one. So not with is a statement of mutual exclusivity. We, again, we saw this a bit in 4N. Mutual exclusivity means you do one or the other, but not both. And mutual exclusivity, this is important, is symmetrical. If you do one and not two, it's the same as two and not doing one. Okay? So how would you add that constraint? Let's just, just, just focus on that one for now. We'll look at this other not with for these other cases in a minute. But how do you code the constraint how do you add a single constraint here to your problem that will enforce that if you do two, you won't do one, or if you do one, you won't do two? Take a second and write out all the possible combinations of that and come up with a constraint that will, will represent that. Arvin, 
Yeah, just add to it. This is the answer? OK, just a second. OK, mutual exclusivity comes up in many, many cases. In a knapsack problem, you might say you can pack either an iPad or a tablet, right? If you pack the iPad, there's no need to pack the tablet. Or if you pack the tablet, there's no need to pack the iPad. So it's one or the other. In, in engineering flow sheets, you, we often get equipment where either you get one equipment or the other equipment, but it makes no sense to buy both pieces of equipment because they functionally perform the same job. So here, project one and project two functionally perform the same job. So you pick one or the other. How would you add that constraint then? Suggestion? Uh, so for example, if you, if you have x1 and x2 are, are conflict, I would, I would take the sum of x1 and x2 and make sure that they're less than or equal to Sum of less than or equal to 1. Trevor? Less than or equal to or equal to? Well, you would want to have the option of having neither, right? So, less than or equal to. OK. So let's take a look at this. Never just accept these um, as is. I always encourage you to write out all the possible combinations here. So 0. Either this one is 0, 0, 1, 1, or this is 0, 1, 0, 1. OK, let's take a look at that combination. The first one says you don't do x1, you don't do x2. That is valid. OK, that's, that's, that's meaningful. You, do, you don't do project x1, you do project x2. That works. You do project x1, you don't do project x2. That still meets the mutual exclusivity. But 1 and 1 is going to equal 2. It's going to violate that constraint. And that's exactly what you want. You only want to pick 1 or 2, not, not both. Okay, So this is a valid way of representing that mutual exclusivity requirement. Okay, Now take it a step up and try to represent the mutual exclusivity. Let's take x3, for example. If you do project x3, you can't do 1 and you can't do 5. Well, let's read the line for x5. If you do x5, you can't do 1 and 3. If you read the line for x1, and you pick x1, you can't do 3 and 5. Right? So all projects 1, 3, and 5 are mutually exclusive. How do you write that constraint? So is it and or? Yeah. You can do and, like, so if, you can't, if you can't do two of them, you can't do one of them each. Yeah, if you do 5, you can't do 1, and you can't do 3. Can you do just one? Yeah, if you pick five, you cannot do one or three. If you pick one, you can't do three and five. Not and, but two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How would you code that mutual exclusivity? Just take it a step further, yeah. Could you not do the same thing there, but do like x1 plus x3 plus x5? Right. Okay, so x1 plus x3, and then. What's on the right hand side? Uh, less than one. Less than one. Okay. Okay, so that's how you code that requirement for mutual exclusivity. In general, mutual exclusivity is written that you sum up over i with whatever i's you're considering must be less than or equal to one. That's the general mutual exclusivity constraint. If you have three, you don't have five, or you don't have one. So you can only do one out of those three. Yeah. yeah. Either one, or three, or five. You can do 
Okay. So, so that's mutual exclusivity. It's a fairly simple form. You just sum up all the things which are mutual exclusive on the left and set them less than or equal to one on the right. Let's uh, take this further now and add dependence between projects. So mutual exclusivity is one type of problem. Dependence is a different type of problem. And this time, dependence is not symmetrical. Mutual exclusivity is symmetrical, right? You saw here with mutual exclusivity means if you select one, you don't get two. If you select two, you don't get one. So it's symmetrical. But dependence is not symmetrical. Project 4 here depends on Project 3. So if you select Project 4, you must have Project 3 as well. How would you add that constraint? Just a second. Make sure you discuss it with the person next to you, and if necessary, work out all the possible combinations of zeros and ones to make sure that it. No, read it this way. If you have four, you must have three. That's why it's not symmetrical. OK, suggestions for how you would code this up in a, in a constraint. Ehima? Um, x4 must be less than or equal to x3. OK, so x4 must be less than or equal to x3. Does that work? Yes, no. Prove it to yourself. Write out all the possible combinations for x4, x3, and see that it either it, it describes that constraint or it doesn't. So this is not stuff that you memorize. You always just. This is not symmetrical, right? So in that case, it work always. OK, so those are all the possible combinations you could get for x3 and x4. Let's see. If you don't select x4, you don't select x3, that constraint is satisfied. This next coding, this next permutation says 0 is less than 1. Is that true? Yeah, that is true. 0 is less than 1. Does it meet this requirement if, you don't, if 4 is not selected and you do have 3 selected? Yeah. Yeah, OK. That meets that requirement. 1 less than 0, is that correct? No. That constraint is not, not true. If, it were, if you did have this combination, the constraint is violated. So saying 1 less than 0 is a violation of your constraints which means that this condition can never exist. Okay? And that condition says if you select 4 and you don't select 3. And that's exactly what you want. You don't want to select 4 without selecting 3. So this is a correct way of coding it because it will prevent the problem from allowing that selection. And then the last one says if you select 4, you also select 3. 1 is less than or equal to 1 is correct and also makes sense. Okay? So that way of coding or representing that requirement of dependence works. Okay, if you don't believe it, try writing 
x3 less than or equal to x4 and working through that same set of logic over there and proving to yourself that that is a wrong way of coding the constraint. It's, if you want to remember anything from this, you might want to remember that xj is less than xi, where j is your dependent and i is your independent. Okay. So in this case, 4 depends on 3. So 4 is your dependent project. 3 is your independent project. You can do 3. It doesn't mean you have to do 4. 3 is independent. j is your dependency. So j is on the left. i, your independent, is on your right. Okay. So what we've learned here are two very crucial types of binary constraints for mutual exclusivity and dependence. We're going to see these regularly. Dependence come up in engineering scheduling. For example, you run your batch reactor. You have to clean it before you use it. Okay? There's a dependency. Clean before you use. Or if you're producing food, you run your nut products, your nut free products first in the reactor and then your nut products afterwards, after cleaning. Right, so there's a dependency of, of order over time. So we're going to see this coming up in scheduling. One depends on the other. So where that goes then to is the next handout that you have in front of you, in fact. Um, and we've actually covered then the first part of that handout. Okay, so the first part of that handout says, how do you represent mutual exclusivity? Mutual exclusivity is represented by saying the sum of certain xi's must be less than or equal to 1, where your summation i is over the projects which are mutually exclusive. Okay, so any of the mutual mutually exclusive selections are counted up and summed on the left and set less than or equal to 1 on the right. How do we represent dependence in general? Dependence in general is represented as xj is less than or equal to xi, where j is your dependent and i is your independent. Okay, and there's a space there for an example. I don't think we need to do this, but if you think of it in engineering, like let's say you're optimizing a flow sheet, you have a mixer followed by a plug flow reactor, followed by a separator. Right, so your mixer followed by your PFR, followed by a separator. And you can call your mixer X1, your plug flow reactor X2, and your separator X3. So then I'll, I'll leave for you to go confirm for yourself at home what that relationship of the variables should be for the, for the dependence, right? So if you want to run the separator, you need to have it being fed by the PFR. You can't run the separator without the PFR. Similarly, you can't run your PFR without your mixer prior to it. So how do you set up that? What sort of, what type of equations would you see there for that, mut for that dependence? Any suggestions? Okay, this is not difficult. This is exactly just applied. Yeah, do one. X1, X2, X3, 
Okay, so you're looking at for mutual exclusivity. So this is this is actually a dependent relationship. Yeah. So I, yeah, you're just reading from the wrong section. That's fine. So if x3, x2, and x1, you might be tempted, and this this uh, you can see how this is possible. You might want to write x1, x2, x3. The product of them must be less than or equal to one. Right? That seems to seems to say that if you're using one, two, and three, that sequence needs to be switched on in some way. But that sets up nonlinearities. You've got the product of three variables here now being nonlinear. So if these are dependencies, we have to understand our dependent direction. We're Is it x3 less than or equal to x2? x2 less than or equal to x1? That's one potential way of coding it. Or is it which is the correct direction? Brandon? Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> two less than three. That's what I meant to write. Sorry. Thanks. Michelle? One on the left is appropriate. OK. So go convince yourself that this is the, uh, the correct approach and that this is not suitable. OK, so again, work through that logic of trying out the ones and zeros. This is not something that you should necessarily memorize. It's something that you can easily just verify by trying all the permutations of them. OK, so we've looked then at, at uh, that sort of problem. Let me, um, this next one on set covering is going to take a little bit longer to work out. So I'll come back to that next class. But actually, I'll, let's flip over page two. And in the last few minutes, just get a sense of task allocation projects. Now, this is one that you can solve intuitively yourself here on paper. So let me w w walk through it with you. We have this idea very commonly in engineering and scheduling that we've seen coming up that if you've got a person, they need to be assigned a task. Or if you've got a job, it gets signed to a workstation or a robot or some device that performs the job. So every person needs to be assigned a task. So one, when one person is doing that task, they can't be doing a second task. So there's no multitasking allowed here. And every task is done by one person. So there's this, again, you're starting to see some of this idea of mutual exclusivity. So don't be surprised when the constraints coming out of this look like mutual exclusivity constraints. But just to give you an idea actually how sharp your mind is relative to computers, can you find the optimal task allocation? So at the end, I want you to say person uh, B must do task 2, and person C must do task 3, etc. Find the optimal task allocation for me that gives you the minimum total time spent.
Okay, so task one. Who should do task one? Person D. Person D. Who should do task two? Task three? A. A. Task C? Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay, so what's your time allocation then for those situations? Let's see. Task D is done by person one, so that's two minutes. Task four is done by person C, so task four by person C is two. Task Two is done by person B, that's three. And task three is done by person A. So task three by person A is four. Okay, four and seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay, and that is the minimum solution. Okay. What your mind just went through there was 24 permutations. You've got four, four factorial combinations that could possibly exist. So four factorial combinations. And you quickly and fairly intuitively found the answer is 11 minutes. If some of you may find 13, 13 also if you work through it seem, seems to come out most frequently. The computer then will follow a very similar approach. If you try to think back the last few minutes what you just did in your mind, right? Just go through the mental process that you have in your mind and remember that. Because when you see how the computer solves this, you're going to see it's remarkably similar to what you just did. Okay, the computer also follows this sort of permutation type approach. So let's actually um, give you a bit of a hint of that. If we go to GAMS and solve this here, um, this is the person task problem. So I'll post this code to the course website. There's that table set up exactly like you do over there. There's your objective function to minimize the time and here's two interesting constraints. So we'll talk about the constraints in next class. They're mutual exclusivity constraints. So that person one can only do one task. Person two can only do two, uh, one task. And this other mutual exclusivity constraint only allows one task to be done by one person. So there's a symmetrical view here. If you run it, you'll see the answer, if we click on that, tells you which person does which task. So you don't necessarily understand the coding there. But what's interesting there is the objective function value is 11 minutes. Okay, So same way. Now, just to give you a hint of what the solver is doing and some terminology we're going to see coming up, if you read this conopt output, the part that's of interest is this discussion here about nodes. Where is it? Um, OK, six iteration, zero nodes. So we're going to see that these solvers represent it with nodes, and they go explore nodes and branches. We're going to use the terminology of trees. So you've got your root of the problem, and then each combination is a branch, and then there's sub-branches of those branches. And what the solver goes and does is it goes and explores a branch and sees if it's feasible. If it's not feasible, it cuts that branch off, and it just ignores any of the sub-nodes. Okay, so that's exactly what your mind was doing when you were going through that table likely. We'll see that in the solver coming up. Okay, so please bring this hand up back to the next class.